before I get into the video, viewer beware. This video will address topics such as pregnancy, childbirth, and infant mortality. If these aren't areas you're comfortable with, proceed with caution or give this video a miss and I'll see you next time. There are no photographs of human remains featured in this video, but I will be showing the results of scans performed on mummified corpses. The Warsaw Mummy Project has been running from the University of Warsaw since 2015. As well as aiming to get a better understanding of mummification practices and how they evolved over time, as well as the religious and ceremonial elements of ancient Egyptian burials, the project also aims to paint a picture of the health of the Egyptians. Although the bodies are of course mummified, eviscerated, and very, very old, there are many investigative tools that can be used to get an impression of the overall health of the mummy being examined. Modern scanning techniques mean that invasive procedures such as unwrapping mummies and removing tissue samples can be kept to a minimum, and the findings can be remarkably detailed. Uh, mummies studied by this and other projects have been able to detect tumours, parasites, infections, and even evidence of certain genetic and metabolic disorders. But one mummy in particular, the reason that you've clicked on this video, stunned researchers when a combination of X-ray and CT scanning revealed that the mummified woman within was pregnant, both at the time of her death and at the time of her mummification. The mummy was found in the sarcophagus of a male priest named Horjahuti. I would like to add that, as far as I know, the person within was not Horjahuti, and we're not talking about the corpse of a transgendered man. From scans, it's clear that the person within presented as female, though we have no information confirming her name or identity. It looks very much as though she was a person of high social status based on the quality of her mummification and the numerous amulets bound into her wrappings, but nothing is certain. As for being in another person's coffin, it could simply be the case that Hojahuti's coffin was reused, as happened moderately often, both in ancient times and in the 19th century, because... The woman, who died sometime in the 1st century BCE, was in her 20s or early 30s. Unlike many other burials where stillborn children are mummified separately, in her case her fetus was left in place rather than being extracted post-mortem. The hypothesis is that this might tell us something about the beliefs of the ancient Egyptians as regards personhood, though I would be cautious. If the only evidence you had of medieval Christian burials was a single plague pit, you would want to be a bit more rigorous before saying that that's how everyone in that period was buried. There is some logic behind the idea that the fetus wouldn't have been extracted for religious reasons. In the ancient Egyptian tradition, the possession of a soul was a complex affair because the soul wasn't a single entity, but three events in particular were important in the creation and imparting of a human soul. At birth, your mother's blood woke up your heart, not just the organ, but the spiritual heart, the centre of emotion and thought. With your first breath, your ka, or life force, entered your body and was thereafter sustained by breathing, eating, and drinking. And thirdly, you were named. Your name was a spiritual amulet that protected your soul by giving its components a single identity. It also meant the gods and other magical forces could recognise you. So you could, for instance, be the recipient of beneficial spells and prayers. A stillborn child may not have necessarily undergone all of those processes, most notably the first breath. But having been born and possibly named, a degree of personhood could be afforded to them. Notably, the mummies that are supposed to be the daughters of Tutankhamun were mummified, though buried without having been named. How this interacts with the religious tradition, I don't feel qualified to speculate, but note that only one of them is thought to have been full term and may have been born living. Infant mortality was an everyday occurrence for much of ancient Egypt, with perhaps 30% of children dying before their first birthday. Back to the recent findings, the mummified fetus is thought to have been at most 30 weeks along, so this is not likely to have been a death resulting from a childbirth complication, though the pregnancy may well itself turn out to have been a cause of death. As well as the religious interpretation that the fetus had not obtained personhood sufficient to warrant an individual burial, we have to consider the practical aspects of mummification. It was important that mummies were as undamaged as possible, so as to ensure the wholeness of the spirit in the afterlife. It's possible that the embalmers at the time judged that removing the fetus might have risked too much damage to the woman, the fetus, or both. Again, it's important not to try to reach ironclad sociological conclusions from a single interesting case. 
Her cause of death remains unknown, though the University of Warsaw team are now on the case. Death from complications arising from pregnancy would have been reasonably common, but this is the first confirmed instance of a mummy left pregnant post-mortem. As a piece of forensic evidence, this find is magnificent. For one thing, researchers may be able to gain an understanding of prenatal medicine and health in general in this era. The investigation will be an interdisciplinary project, and its findings are sure to be fascinating, so watch this space. To leave the video on the same sombre note that's been playing throughout, I think this case also highlights that while for many of us the mummies of ancient Egypt are curiosities, they are human. There will have been a good deal of grief surrounding this woman's death, and while I don't have any religious or philosophical belief that makes me think she can now be made to suffer if her remains are treated poorly, we should perhaps remember that however long ago she lived and died, there, but for the whims of society and history, we lie. I hope you found this as interesting and thought-provoking as I did. It's definitely a pretty heavy topic once you get over the initial fascination. Let me know in the comments if you want to see more mummy videos. There are plenty of amazing mummies out there that tell us an awful lot about Egyptian life and society. Next week, I promise to present something a little lighter, though it would be hard not to. As always, life, prosperity, and health to you all. Thanks for watching. Head over to my channel for more, or click here to see what the YouTube demons think you should watch next. I hope you'll consider subscribing. If you'd like to support and collaborate on the channel with me, go to patreon.com slash armchair Egypt. You can also join my Discord community, there's an invite link in the description.